even though I was late, I'm now a minute early. <laughs> well played. I say Louis gets really annoyed because all the clocks are around 15 minutes fast, but only around. So it depends what clock you're looking at. And I kind of do do it on purpose, but it does mean it doesn't always work. So we're live now. Let's just go over to Facebook. Like I say, I'll be in the comment section as well. There we go. Uh, so we've still got a whole minute. So hello, six people who are here already, eager beavers. Feel free to say hello. Hi. Let's see if anyone, oh, 12 already, lovely. Oh, that's amazing. That must be a new thing that is automatically doing captions on Facebook. That's great. Oh, really? Yeah, that's really useful. I didn't know it did that. I think it's a new thing. It didn't used to. Automatically doing captions. Oh. Yeah, you might want to yeah. turn us off. Uh, so hello, 16 people. Hello, Amanda. Um, doing our normal thing. Just going to sit here for a second, let people get in, and then we'll do some intros. 18 of you already, lovely. Cool, you're all eager. Fantastic. This must be one that people are particularly interested in too. Sandy, Sandy Botha. Oh, that's my mum. <laughs> hello, Monique's mum. Jacinta, Leslie, Nicola, hello, lovely people. 2021 of us already, fantastic. So this is obviously one that does interest people. No pressure or anything. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, there's nobody there. It's just, it's just, it's just us room. three, don't worry. <laughs> um, so I'll do, I'll do a quick intro. Um, we're still filling up a little bit, which is lovely. Um, so hello, I am Dr. Chloe Faraha, everybody who's on Old Academy already. Um, and I'm joined by my co-presenter, David Gray Hammond. Hello. And today we are joined by uh, Dr. Monique Botha. Um, and if you've not uh, been to Academy before, we are an educative platform where we talk about and educate about anything relating to autistic experience, but by only autistic people. Um, so, which is our ethos. So today um, with uh, Dr. Monique Botha here, we are talking about autistic stigma and particularly minority stress. Now I'm assuming you explain that in your presentation. So for people who are uh, in the comment section, we're doing part presentation and then just some discussion. And if you've got any questions, um, I've seen some of uh, Monique's stuff before. So this is a particularly interesting topic. Um, personally, I'm very interested in stigma from my own background, but I'm really interested in the minority stress aspect as well. So that's not something I've come across before. So 26, lovely. So what we tend to do first before we jump in to the presentation part is we always ask our guests, um, we already know who you are, but who are you and what is or are your specialisations? Wonderful. So um, as you said, I'm Dr Monique Botha and I am an autistic autism psychologist, research psychologist and I tend to focus on minority stress, autistic community connectedness and mental health. Um, so particularly I'm interested in understanding the mental health disparity between um, non-autistic people and autistic people. Yeah. And also I am a lover of books, as you can tell um, by my office. <laughs> And that's the thing as well. I think we tend to, because obviously we ask what people's specialisations are. Um, I think it is interesting that a lot of us obviously end up in roles based on the things we're really interested in. Um, so our next one is always, when were you discovered autistic? Um, so actually I had an inkling around about the time that I was 19. Um, I had just gone to university um, and I think a gap opened up where I wasn't quite like the people around me and I could get by in school because I had um, a couple of close friends um, who were just as peculiar as me um, and so 
it worked then I went to university um and I don't know if it's okay to swear but basically shit just got wild um and suddenly there was this increasing gap between me and my peers I wasn't keeping up with the things that everyone else found really easy um I ended up having some really bad mental health difficulties um and then came across um some work on autism I was like oh god (laughs) um and then ended up being um assessed because I was like I think I think this might be might be me um and then about age I think it was 20 I got a diagnosis um yeah lovely thank you and I think for a lot of late discover people that's kind of yeah the poorer mental health might lead to realizing not always I think but that can be an aspect of that Um, all this talk of mental health I'm really excited for this presentation now because you know mental health's my jam so (laughs) which is why yeah I I said to David if yeah if you get to pick which ones that they want to come on if like Tigger wants to come on David wants to come on so I think this is be great so what we'll do then is we oh and make sure you've got sharing rights so David and I are just going to disappear into the background um and David feel free to do it however you like so if you want to make any you know notes or anything like that if that's useful or if you just want to sort of do it off the cuff when we come back we'll have a discussion um about the topic that's all right okay. lovely okay so we'll see you we're still here but we'll um we'll turn our cameras and things off wonderful I will share my screen Um, two seconds sorry i'm struggling to find it all of a sudden uh, there we go and it's a really bad place that i can Wonderful. So, um, as we've said, I'm going to be covering minority stress, mental health and autism. Um, A quick introduction to me. Like I said, I'm autistic. I'm an academic that focuses on autism, minority stress, mental health and autistic community connectedness. Um, I'm actually currently a research fellow at the University of Stirling, but I still live down south um, in the southeast of the UK. Um, it's virtual at the moment because pandemic. Um, I did my MSc and my PhD at the University of Surrey in psychology. Um, and actually before this, my undergraduate was in social care practice. Um, and during that time I worked with young, um, autistic people and children and their families, um, as a social care practitioner before I moved into psychology and research Um, and that was based in Ireland um, where my family's actually based Um, yeah so I'm gonna put the content warning in and I do this for any talk where I cover these things because um, there's a lot that's quite sensitive in nature including touching upon suicidality mental illness and victimization Um, I also appreciate that it's a very difficult topic for many people. It's important to be kind to yourself um, during and after the talk. And I like to remind people that it's okay to step away and come back um, because it is really intensive. And I think for a community like ours, the autistic community, mental health is such a big issue, but there's also um, a lot of things like suicidal ideation and it can be quite triggering, triggering. So it's, it's okay to step away um and also it sounds really cliche but doing something comforting afterwards can be good and i always point this out to people because sometimes it can be hard to know exactly what to do when something's distressing personally my go-to is going on to reddit r and looking at all of the cute little fluffy animals and you wouldn't think that it would work but for me it does um especially when there's cute little kittens 
and dogs and it just helps me recenter myself so if there is something that works for you it's a good idea to maybe do it after this and just ground yourself again um so i'm going to begin by talking about the prevalence of co-occurring mental health conditions in the autistic community um and neurodivergent people generally are more likely to have co-occurring mental health conditions compared to non-neurodivergent people and this includes anxiety depression and post-traumatic stress disorder um, and we've got very little research actually on other um, neurodivergent populations around this but for autistic people um, this can be up to six times higher um, especially for anxiety and depression and also it can be taken less seriously um, or go unrecognized because of what's termed diagnostic overshadowing which is a fancy way of saying that doctors or professionals or psychologists or psychiatrists might put everything down to autism and blame everything on autism so it kind of overshadows the fact that there might be anxiety or depression happening as well for a person um, at the extreme of this um, and it's important to understand that anxiety and depression can start at a quite a young age so a recent study found that actually um, for autistic children by the age of six a substantial number um, meet the criteria for anxiety or depression so it starts quite young um, and unfortunately autistic people are also more likely to self-harm um, both in ways that are easily recognized as self-harm but sometimes in non-traditional ways that are less recognized as self-harm um, which means that they that can also go ignored um, at its extreme autistic people are at a much higher risk of having thoughts of suicide attempts of it and unfortunately are more likely to die early by suicide so um whenever people talk about early mortality and autism one of the leading causes is unfortunately suicide um, and there is a high rate um, of people taking their own lives um, to put this in perspective two-thirds of autistic people have suicidal ideation which is um, quite frequent thoughts of suicide while one-third have a history of attempts so it's it's really prevalent across our community the really terrifying thing that i like to make clear actually and this is more personal a lot of autistic people cannot picture becoming adults um so especially i mean when I was younger, I could never picture myself past probably the age of 22. Um, and when I was younger, I actually thought that there was a substantial chance that I myself would end up dying by suicide because I had really bad depression. Um, there was, even though I was being seen by the community mental health team, they, they didn't really know what was happening um they were the services itself were overstretched and overrun um i didn't have a diagnosis um as being autistic yet um and i wasn't taken seriously a lot of the time actually because my face wouldn't necessarily match my tone so i would tell people that i was distressed and they would kind of be like yeah, but you're not really, are you? Because your face isn't showing it. Um, and basically what that is, is autistic people aren't necessarily believed about their own emotions because people, you autistic people tend to say it in a way that other people don't register as genuine. And it's not a problem with how autistic people say it. It's a problem with how autistic people are heard. Um, and I think something that's really important when we talk about this is actually it's masking, which is basically that autistic people from a very young age, and this is before um, autistic people know they're autistic, this is before anyone might know that the child is autistic, is we're forced to mask. Um, and we're forced to try to figure out the social rules around us and fit in. Um, 
So by the time that we're even teenagers, we've spent so long trying to understand these um, invisible rules that surround us and trying to kind of keep up with um, the, the social conduct of people around us that we end up putting on this mask all the time. And this can travel over into when we're trying to express the fact that we're distressed or not doing well, which means that we might not do it in a way where people are like, oh yeah, that person is distressed because they're wearing it on their face. Um, and I actually think that for me, masking is a huge part of that. Um, I'm so used to putting on a certain face when I leave the house um, that even when something bad happens, I can smile and people can look at me and be like, why aren't you falling to pieces? And I'll kind of be like, because that's, that's not allowed. It's an unspoken social rule that you're not meant to express sadness because sadness makes other people uncomfortable. Um, so masking was a lot of what was happening for me. Um, and I think it happens for a lot of people in that you stop being able to just kind of show that you're not doing okay. Um, which means that people often say that it came out of the blue when there is suicidal ideation or when there is an attempt of suicide or when someone unfortunately dies by suicide. Lots of people will say, well, you know, it came out, out of the blue. I didn't see it coming. But the truth is that it, it never comes out of the blue. There is always something that leads up to it. The problem that I found when we were trying to understand this disparity is that psychology in general, it focuses on the individual, right? So we've spent so long thinking about the thinking process, processes, personality traits, the feelings and emotions and the actions of autistic people. And it's the equivalent of putting people under a magnifying glass and trying to figure out what's happening with autistic people um, to make this happen. The biggest problem is that it's a really pathologizing way of looking at it and it can be victim blaming because it's like, well, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with the way that you think that you're ending up like this? And it also puts all of the onus to change on the individual because the whole thing becomes, well, if you just thought about the world a bit differently, if you just acted a bit differently, you wouldn't be depressed, you wouldn't be anxious. And it also doesn't support long-term change. And I'll explain this when we go through because you'll, you'll see exactly why. The ultimate truth of it is that we tend to blame autistic people for their outcomes. So for example, in psychology, which is, I don't know, infamous for pathologizing difference, um, we look at the outcomes of autistic people, we see that they die earlier and that one of the causes is by suicide, we see anxiety and depression, and we say, well, autism must be such a terrible thing because look at these poor autistic people ending up with so many mental health conditions. Um, therefore, we must obviously cure autism because it's such a terrible thing. Um, and it puts in this idea that autistic people are incapable of flourishing because if they were, so many people wouldn't end up with mental health issues, which is the kind of logic that I started seeing when I started my master's. I saw lots of these arguments in the literature that basically blamed autistic people for their outcomes. But actually, when you put autistic people in a broader social context, it suddenly makes sense. I was really frustrated that people weren't looking at what was happening in families and homes. They weren't looking at what was happening in schools and communities that might actually cause some of this. They weren't looking at the barriers to, for example, healthcare access or what was happening in local communities. And they weren't looking at the role of things like norms, including normativity and expectations, or actually the social and cultural values that surround autistic people. Um, and a big part of this is neuronormativity, um, which is the assumption that everyone thinks um, 
and experiences the world in the same way or that they should experience and think about the world in the same way. And it also refers to the structures in the world that are set up around a dominant way of thinking. And the truth is, these systems, because they're made for like the most average person, they're often confusing, ambiguous. Um, and when you experience the world differently, um, and you don't necessarily understand all of these invisible rules, it's inaccessible. Um, and this is something that kind of overlays the whole system of minority stress, um, which I'll introduce now. So the idea behind minority stress is that decreased social standing um, and status result in an increased stress burden, um, resulting in health inequalities. And actually, the reason that I came to focus on minority stress, as I'll go on to say, was because of the pathology. But I also happened to be in the right place at the right time. So when I was doing my master's at the University of Surrey, um, I came across an academic, David Frost, um, and he gave us a seminar one day on minority stress and the LGBTQ community. And primarily his research has focused on the role of minority stress um, and um, LGBT plus health inequalities. But he was describing a lot of the processes and I was like, oh, wait a minute, and I had this lightning strike. Um, and basically the, the essence of it is that when you have decreased social standing, you don't only have um, higher stress burdens, but you also have fewer social resources with which to handle that stress burden. So it's kind of like you've got more work to deal with and also less tools and resources no wonder certain communities, especially marginalized communities, end up with these health inequalities. Um, and as I said, it's traditionally used to understand LGBT plus health inequalities. Um, and after he had talked to me, actually, I ended up in his office and I was like, I have a proposal for you. I think this might actually be really relevant to the autistic community. And as it happens, the autistic community also tends to overlap with the LGBT plus community quite a bit. A lot of autistic people are also sexual and gender minorities. I think there's something good can happen here. Um, and me being me, I said all of that. And he was like, hi, I'm David. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm Monique. Let's do this project. Um, yeah, he was very kind about it, even though I was slightly awkward and actually suddenly when you put autistic people in context and you look at the pattern of stress exposure suddenly everything makes sense because autistic people live within a neuronormative world are exposed to stigma dehumanization and marginalization within communities autistic people are more likely to have school exclusions peer victimization, um, social exclusion from friendship groups, um, more likely to be lonely, and often in marginalized from micro communities. And when I say micro communities, I tend to refer to things like, for example, churches, which is a small community within a community, kind of like Russian nesting dolls. Um, and that's a community, for example, where you see it happen quite often, um, where videos get put up online and you see that, for example, a family was removed from a church because the autistic child was stimming or, you know, happy flapping or something. And they were like, no, that's disruptive. You must leave. Um, they're also more like autistic people were more likely to experience disability based hate crime. Um, and this can be everything from being verbally abused in the street um, to full-on physical violence um, and unfortunately we see this crop up again and again and again where um, autistic children, teens, adolescents, adults end up being assaulted and sometimes being murdered um, because of disability, 
hate crime. Autistic people are also more likely to, for, for example, be stopped by the police. Um, and police-based violence takes far too many autistic lives every year. Um, and this is even more of a risk for autistic people of colour um, and black autistic people because there's an intersection there with race that leaves them even more vulnerable. Um, and similarly, then you've got healthcare inequalities where autistic people are less likely to be believed, um, more likely to um, not have access to certain services that they should. So, for example, um, after I got an autism diagnosis, I stopped being eligible for some mental health treatment, even though I had raging depression. Um, because they were like, well, you're autistic. We don't, you know, we don't work with autistic people. Um, so we're more likely to fall between the cracks. Then in terms of family and peer relationships and relationships, autistic people are more likely to be bullied and exposed to make crime. Um, unfortunately, we're more likely to suffer from intimate partner violence, including verbal, physical, sexual and financial abuse. Um, and this also includes controlling and abusive relationships um, throughout the lifespan. It also includes domestic violence. Autistic children are more likely to be emotionally, physically and verbally abused by parents. And every year we have a day of remembrance, for example, for autistic children who die um, to filicide, which is quite literally the most extreme version where autistic children are killed by caregivers. Um, we're also more likely to experience sexual abuse, both by family members and in intimate partners um, and by strangers. It's, it's really horrific. Um, and in the middle of all of that, you have this autistic person trying to get their own needs met, often within systems that are marginalizing them, not giving them room to, you know, just have basic human rights. Um, navigating that stress, trying to develop an identity for themselves, positive, even though they get really negative messages. And they're, they're trying to cope with all of these layers of marginalization and still come out being like, you know, marginally happy. It's awful. But actually, none of that is ever talked about really a lot in the literature when people talk about autistic outcomes. And that's where minority stress comes in, because minority stress looks at victimization and discrimination, everyday discrimination, which are like those microaggressions. So these are like the most subtle forms of discrimination. So for example, I once disclosed being autistic to someone and it was actually um, a boss of mine when I was doing a work placement. And she was like, you're very pretty for an, for an autistic person. And I was like, I, I don't know what to say to that. And then she asked whether or not I like my mother's affection. And I was like, I'm gonna go do that filing. Yeah, it's like those microaggressions where people are saying things that you know lets you know that they don't really think much of disabled people or autistic people then you've got expectation of rejection um which kind of measures how much you think someone from a group like you um so for example autistic people will be rejected in society um and how much you come to expect rejection from other people um outness which is basically like how much you disclose being autistic in different scenarios, like with peers, with family, with work, um, with health professionals. Physical concealment or masking, um, which is like hiding autistic traits. So you might like not 
be stimming, for example, when you want to stim. And then internalized stigma, which is where you get all of these negative messages about being autistic, and then you start kind of internalizing it and thinking about it. And you're kind of, it can become like you endorse those beliefs and it's really hard not to when you get the messages all the time and suddenly when we applied this model what we saw was that minority stress actually predicts social well-being psychological well-being emotional well-being and psychological distress and the model is actually explained between like 45 and 72 percent of the variance of those um, well-being and psychological distress scores and what this means in layman's term is that it it explains a lot it actually explains a lot about the psychological outcomes of autistic people and that's before you even start considering the intersections between autism race sexuality and gender um, because these are all things that also get you exposed potentially to more minority stress. Um, so for example, black autistic people have a unique intersection there where, for example, they're more, there's more concern around things like violent policing. Um, similarly, autistic people are more likely to be um, a gender minority, such as being trans or non-binary, and that comes with its own forms of marginalization um, and autistic people are also more likely to be a minority sexual identity which again overlaps and suddenly when you're putting autistic people in the context you realize that intervening with the individual is never going to work because they're getting exposed to marginalization from all sides right so they're having these experiences in homes in relationships at school and work um with regards to healthcare, in communities and with norms and expectations um and social and cultural values um in which autistic people are systematically undervalued so yeah it means instead of addressing only one layer of crisis we kind of need to do two. That doesn't mean that you ignore the individual. Um, no, there's there's crisis there. Autistic people need proper mental health and well-being support. Um, and I always make this really clear. There is no shame in therapy or medication. Not enough autistic people have long-term mental health care um, that works for them. And I see a lot of people shame people for taking medication and they're like, oh, that's not a proper solution. Um, medication helps keep some of us alive. For example, I take medication and if it weren't for medication, I probably wouldn't be around anymore. Um, there's no shame in therapy. Um, I go to therapy. It has helped me immensely, but neither of these things are silver bullets. Um, because there isn't a strong evidence base at the moment for therapeutic interventions that help autistic people process things like trauma. Um, and there needs to be a better evidence base. So it's not like this is the silver bullet um, for multiple reasons, including the fact that autistic people are more likely to live in poverty, which means well, being less likely um, to access long term good mental health care. But it also means addressing a second layer in society. Um, it means addressing the neuronormativity that marginalizes autistic people. It means creating interventions to lessen things like stigma, dehumanization and marginalization, because as long as those things are happening, how can autistic people as a whole really flourish? Um, it also means taking action against ableism, victimization, and violence. And it also means naming these things when it happens. So whenever something really violent happens, especially if a child dies to filicide, we tend to not really call it that. 
um, the news is really bad for this, where they kind of, they're like, oh yeah, but, you know, the parents must have been really stressed, and you're like, still murder. Yes, they might have needed intervention there, but the answer is never going to be inflicting that violence on your child, ever, not even once, never in a million years. Um, and we don't name that violence, we, we dance around it, it's just murder. Um, it also means naming that violence in a way that we don't really. Psychology has a terrible habit, and I like lost my temper about this on Twitter the other day. Psychology is a habit of blaming autistic people even for their victimization. So you see authors say, yeah, it's because autistic people lack a theory of mind. That's why someone, you know, victimize them but that's that's not that's not true autistic people are dehumanized and that legitimizes violence and blaming autistic people for that victimization is just a new level of shit on top of that where we're then like it's actually your fault that we're doing this to you it's not it's the fact that autistic people are marginalized it makes it easier it makes autistic people more vulnerable to these things happening but it's only ever one person's fault and it's the person who perpetrates anyway but i did lose my temper about that because a paper got published like six months ago um and again it was all victim blamey and i was like enough is enough um and it also means that we need to provide accessible welcoming spaces something to just break up the monotony of discrimination and marginalization even a small space that is accessible to autistic people can mean the world because it's different to the constant marginalization this is not to say that autistic people's lives are only violence and i also make this clear all the time and this is not to say that autistic people's lives are devoid of joy or that autistic people's lives are a tragedy none of these things are true autistic people resist reframe and reclaim even amongst all of this autistic people are always finding a way to create agency for themselves like we resist neuronormativity um and we i think as a community are really good at challenging the notion that autistic ways of thinking are inherently negative um and that includes making spaces for autistic ways of thinking and i will claim absolutely no responsibility in creating these spaces it's the people that came before me and even looking at what dr chloe farrow had, has done i'm in awe um because it is creating a hub of autistic thinking and being like this is a legit legitimate way of being regardless of what anyone else thinks um and i know that the work of for example damien milton has really done that um i am in awe of him like all the time it also autistic people are reframing that tragedy narrative and most of the time it's into neutrality i won't say all the time because you get weird things like aspie supremacy which is not ideal and is based in eugenics and it's not the way to go um but it's where autistic people are like autism isn't a disaster it's not a superpower it's just a fact it's just something that is um like being left-handed or being right-handed it's a fact of life um and that also means being honest about strengths weaknesses and disability um as i go more and more into my like work i'm trying to be more open about where my weaknesses are because people can look at me so for example the other day a therapist someone i did my masters with they've gone into therapy they sent me a message and they were like oh yeah yeah, yeah. you know when i have autistic um you know clients now yeah, I use you as an example to show that autism isn't limiting and the diagnosis isn't like life limiting. And I was like, don't use me as a stick to beat other autistic people with. 
no. <laughs> um, but people get this idea because I've got a PhD and because I'm like good at certain things, they're like, oh, autism isn't a disability then. And I'm like, it can both be a disability and neutral. Um, so I'm trying to be more open about the things that I really struggle with, um, such as like tasks of what they call like everyday living. I'm really bad at like keeping up with things like um, cleaning. And I, I don't mean that in like a ha ha ha, I only vacuum once a month sort of way. I mean, it is a real struggle for me. Um, and when a room becomes really messy, I can't even begin to start. Um, so then everything piles up and it becomes a wreck. And if someone saw it, they would be like, so that is a huge thing for me. And I also have like really, really bad anxiety all the time. Um, I'm as human as everyone else. I have strengths and I have weaknesses and I'll never drive because I get behind the car, the wheel of a car and I panic so much that I'm like, this, this is just never happening. Um, and also autistic people are like reclaiming language, including, um, reclaiming the term autistic as a neutral descriptor of a person instead of being this really bad thing, which it, actually when I interviewed autistic people, they were like, yep, like I'm using this word so that I can change people's mind about what it actually means. So when I say I'm autistic, I mean, here are my strengths, here are my weaknesses. It's not a bad thing. Um, and this also includes taking control of the narrative of their autism and of autism in general and taking that back from professionals um, and researchers who are not autistic who have gotten to define autism for far too long. Um, similarly, autistic people experience community connectedness, including belongingness, social connectedness and this political connectedness. And that is a real drive to make things better for the next autistic people. And actually a lot of the work that autistic people do is to make it easier for the next generation um, of autistic people and autistic kids who are growing up so that they can have it slightly better at minimum than we had it. Um, and the autistic community that I, what I learned through my PhD is vibrant and it is bustling and it is beautiful and it is multifaceted and complicated and wonderful. Um, and what my research um, showed was that autistic people experience a closeness with other autistic people that they don't necessarily feel with other people um, and that an autistic identity is important to this. Um, not all autistic people have a connectedness to the autistic community um, but a lot, pe a lot of people experience at least like one form of connectedness, whether that's belongingness, social connectedness, or that political drive to make something better um, for the next generation. Um, and the last study on my thesis, what it showed was that autistic community connectedness does disrupt that relationship between minority stress and well-being changes it it reduces it um and that's really important but actually it doesn't it doesn't matter because as long as autistic people are experiencing minority stress mental health is gonna be poor because you can't survive all of those things unscathed ultimately it means that society needs to do better and it needs to do better now because this is why autistic people experience such poor mental health. It's not because autistic people are broken. It's not because autistic people are autistic. It's that once you put them in context, there is a lot of violence in autistic people's lives. Yeah. So, haha. -ha. Um, Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'll just, there's David, lovely. Um, just, oh yeah, there, stop share. And I'm just thinking, I quote you a number of times when they're discussing 
the stigma and I quite like because you seem to come at it because I've not heard of that because in social psychology I didn't come across minority stress as a concept or a process um, so I kind of have been writing more recently in terms of social cure properties so obviously when you talk about material and psychological resources you get from connecting with your community and 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 things like that so that's when and then I came across your work as well which is why you're here because we wanted to hear, I wanted to hear about it um so fantastic thank you so much um David did you have any thoughts or comments otherwise I'll keep waffling I mean first of all that was a mind-blowing presentation I absolutely loved every minute of it um but <clears throat> there were there were two questions that really kind of arose for me um and and a statement which is the first one that I, that thing you said about uh, autistic people not being able to pitch themselves as adults um i think that's a really valid point and actually i'll go a step further and say even now as an autistic adult i struggle to picture myself as an autistic elder um, you know and I, I think that that's that's a real issue but but my questions really arose because as anyone who's watched my videos here that i've done with academy knows um, my focus is really uh, addiction in the autistic community, uh, as well as some some looking at mental health, because I have personal experience. I, I'm both an addict and I've experienced psychosis. And um, yeah, I was I was thinking, um, you know, I've, I've spoken a lot in my writing about um, how resources for like addiction treatment services are not designed for to be accessible for autistic and neurodivergent people and i realize now what what i've essentially been talking about but never known the word for is minority stress um and i was just wondering what you thought um the role of minority stress might be in the development of substance use disorders mm -hmm. and to follow on from that there is a distinct lack of research into substance use disorders and addiction amongst autistic people and i wondered what your thoughts might be on why there is that disparity so a couple of things actually the minority stress model has been used to examine things like addiction in lgbt plus communities um and actually the it is it does show um for that community that it plays a role um and part of that is that when you've got also fewer social support networks um addiction thrives in isolation um and autistic people can become incredibly isolated and i think and there isn't a lot of research on this but actually it can be a way of almost moderating that. I know myself that for a while, actually, I smoked. Um, and at first it was social smoking. And then actually it became a way of coping because I would take myself out of a situation and it would be almost like this socially acceptable way of saying, I'm going to go outside now um, and just stand by myself for five minutes and smoke a cigarette um and it was a way of both escaping some like really dodgy kind of like microaggression situations um and a lot of overwhelmingness and then the really shit thing was i'd you know i'd go to the doctor and they'd ask if i smoked and i'd be like only a couple now and then and then i'd get an entire lecture about how it's terrible for you blah 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 and i would look at the doctor and be like do you think i don't know this do you think that i don't know that this is bad for my health but do you know what's worse for my health being bombarded day in day out with microaggressions and violence and bullshit and not getting mental health care so you know what if you want to step up and give me some form of like long-term therapy then great, but if not, maybe don't judge me. Um, and I think that there is something to that, right? If you've got an overwhelming stress burden, then you're going to start relying on anything that you can to make some of that less bad. Um, so actually, I think in future, that is something that should be looked at and needs to be looked at. 
Um, and I think it would also explain some of the other disparities in the autistic community. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I especially, I, I definitely agree with the smoking thing. I, I wrote an article for, for Neuroclastic uh, earlier this year, actually. And in it, I was talking about the fact that one of the reasons why autistic people like to smoke, if they do smoke, is because it is a socially acceptable reason to leave the situation, you know. Exactly. And I think, you know, I, I was talking about the fact that, you know, nicotine addiction is one of these addictions that no one really talks about. Um, but it, it's, I think it's probably quite prevalent, actually, in the autistic community, because it's it's obviously i mean with my addictions the sort of addictions i had they were not socially acceptable um you know it was very obvious that i was doing something i shouldn't be doing um or you were at least it was very obvious to everyone who was passing judgment on me that i shouldn't be doing it um but with smoking that was the hardest that that in a way it was a, it was a really hard one to knock on the head and i still to this day vape because uh it gives me an excuse to just go outside, be away from people. Um, and no one goes, well, why do you need to do that? You know? <laughs> exactly. And it's so interesting because that itself, it shows you how embedded neuronormativity is in the world, right? Because you've got to justify leaving a situation. Um, you've always got to justify meeting your own needs when you're autistic. So if you decide that you need to go outside to just like breathe for a moment, there'll be always at least one person that is like but why and if you start stimming but why um and i think the thing about neuronormativity is that autistic people justify their existence day in day out including just getting their own needs met um that is a perfect example people are you know even if you want to take yourself outside it's easier to be like well I'm going for a cigarette rather than being like, I'm autistic, you're doing my head in, I can't cope with the lights, everything's a bit loud, and I wish you'd all just shut up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I also liked what you were talking about, how, um, you know, autistic people uh, struggle to get access to good quality long-term mental health care. Because I know for me, once I access that good quality long-term mental health care, that was really a, a seminal moment in me overcoming psychosis, overcoming addiction. And without those two things, I never would have also found the autistic community, which then led to my continued well-being. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm willing to admit now, I, I still have uh, mental health care professionals who work with me to this day, and I've been working with them for years. Um, and uh you know they 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 do a great deal of good for me but it, it does sadden me that it because it is very difficult to access this if you're autistic i know many autistic people who go to the doctors and the most they'll get is a gp going oh well here's some you know here's some antidepressants and uh have a good day and a pamphlet <laughs> and i think that that kind of feeds into a lot of issues with therapists um, and not we're not knocking therapists we're knocking the system that creates the therapist so it's yeah. not you know because those therapists typically want to help people um so it's knocking the issue with the system and even if you're not autistic if we're talking about any psychological distress responses like voice hearing like extreme anxiety like extreme depression and so on is what you talked about um many towards the end which was addressing those two layers so problematically therapy focuses far too much on the individual and sometimes it's actually needing to fix the our disordered society would actually improve a lot of people's well-being um so that's sort of um a, a sort of shout out i guess to professor peter kinderman who writes about that that we actually need a much more holistic way of supporting people a lot of people's well-being issues would be um improved at least if not you know not saying that everybody will be completely perfect in terms of their well-being but improved by just having stable housing and you know not living in poverty and things like this so the issue 
yeah, I think that was really interesting. Like you say, addressing those two layers, not just the individual who's in crisis, because you're just trying to fix, if you like, which you can't, but trying to fix an individual and then throw them back out into that really traumatizing environment. And for us, that's pretty much everywhere, sadly, or it can be. Yeah, and and the other thing which I really enjoyed in that presentation was uh, talking about the intersections. And yes, I'm going to talk about autistic addicts again. There's a surprise. Um, you know, a, a, another intersection for me was you talked about how, you know, mental health problems are sort of uh, minimised and it's like, oh, it's all part of the autism. Well, the interesting one I had was um, mine were all part of my addiction, apparently. Um, so they wouldn't treat the mental health problems till the addiction was gone. But then the mental health service wouldn't treat the mental health you know it, 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 and it just went round and round and round and uh, and then once once the addiction was gone they went oh he's got mental health problems oh it must be the autism but then my mental health problems were so severe that they went oh hang on no we can't actually blame that and it just became this complicated mess and in the meantime there was me a person in the middle of all this going can someone please just help me <laughs> and and that's what i say when so um with a Peter Kinderman's work a couple of his books is basically talking about that's what we need we need that in all those services need to talk to each other you don't just need a therapist you also need a very good social worker for instance to actually help you with the issues that are going on in your outside world outside that therapeutic setting um, as well as them actually understanding you're autistic which means that autistic neurology will impact the presentation of your psychological distress because david's mentioned this before um our friend um jessica's also mentioned before that you know you've been told you can't have a diagnosis of psychosis for instance which i'm not necessarily that don't necessarily know if that's a problem or not per se but because you don't present like a person with psychosis and it's like well you're not going to and i think this is one of the biggest issue so one of the reasons that I think I focused on this was when I was growing up I like because everyone sees me now and they hold me up as like this poster child right and I think the problem is when we see an autistic person we can't imagine them ever being different and actually I think Chloe touched on this once where she was like we we see an autistic person and that is what we think they will be for their entire lives but actually, my, my teenage years were exceptionally traumatic. I was melting down, like, multiple times a day, every day, every week, month on month. No one knew what was happening. The services wouldn't necessarily get involved because they were like, oh, well, you're not really severe enough, um, except... I was getting further and further into depression and I mean the first time that I thought about ending my own life I was 11 and they still did nothing so I'm like well you haven't taken any, any actions yet have you so you mustn't really be that suicidal and then I did try because I was like if this is what I need to do for you to see that I am suffering then I will um, and I just wanted the pain to stop because I was in, a, in an exceptional amount of pain. And then when I did see a psychologist, the first question they asked me was, <laughs> and I'll never forget this, are you suicidal? I was like, you haven't even asked me my name. Like, you haven't talked to me like I'm human. The second question they asked me was, are you sexually active? I was like... 13 or 14 at the time and I was like A, why are you asking me this? And I just shut down so I literally I became situationally mute. I was like I just, I couldn't talk I was so anxious. So then they went out to my to my mother and was like yeah I think it's bipolar depression and my mother was like you've been in there for five minutes and they're like yeah but she's not answering any of the questions she's she's not being compliant 
Um, and that usually points to bipolar depression in girls. So it doesn't. It it points to you've 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 made that person feel unsafe. Uh huh. And I just and when an autistic person shuts down, we pathologize them even more. We don't look at the environment. We don't see that we've made someone like super hostile. Which is like, oh yeah, it's their fault. It's part of the disorder, right? Um, and then basically said Prozac and my mother was like well I would want to talk that over with her um I told my mother I was uncomfortable going straight on to medication I was like I don't know what that's gonna do to me what about who I am as a person they haven't explained to me what that'll do what if I become less myself um so my mother was like you know she doesn't want to um and then they made my my parents sign a waiver saying that if I did take my own life, it would be their fault because they didn't force me onto medication. When I eventually got a diagnosis um, and someone was like, you're autistic, I was like, oh my god, this finally means that I can get tailored help because I won't be that 14 year old sitting in a psychiatrist or psychologist's office having like this, you know, revolving door of psychologists just tell me that I need to get on with my life um and that was my very rude introduction <laughs> into the fact that actually the second that you do have a diagnosis it becomes harder because then they're like no the services for mental health issues are in this service the services for autism are here but you're an adult now so you don't really qualify for any of those because it's really children who are autistic um and I was like I don't care who helps me I need someone to help me I don't care if it comes out of your budget or your budget or like anyone else's budget I'm I'm in distress and they're like mm, yeah but you don't take our boxes um, and that's the problem it's too much trying to separate people into those boxes of it's this disorder quotation marks over here this disorder over here and those two things can't combine and it's like we're well more so but we're just as likely although like I say more so to develop psychological distress responses because we're more likely to be victims of trauma and like you say everyday violence and microaggressions and so on and so we're just more likely to develop those things i just want to come back to because david touched on it and i think it's quite important which is i also found it really interesting um as david did to hear that lots of autistic people that you've looked at this or, or um seen some research or something on that lots of autistic people can't imagine becoming adults and so i david you've already mentioned that that was the case for you it was for the case for me it's the case for some um, young people that i've been consulting with and i think this is really important to normalize talking about this but also do we have any reminding everybody who's who's listening that we're not clinicians um, but are there any things that we can talk about in terms of supporting people to understand that does that make sense so yeah, from my personal uh, experiences as a teenager, very similar to what you described, Monique, my most of my childhood and my teenage years were quite traumatic um, and distressing. And I couldn't imagine uh, getting past the age of 20. That was like, in my head, that was the cutoff. Um, and I just couldn't imagine more than that. And like I say, uh, I've been um, consulting with some fantastic young people who are just the most amazing beautiful interesting autistic people um to get like that i get the privilege to have a chat with and um sadly it's the same thing you know we can't talk about the future i can't use the word you know future and things like that so can you is there any more that you know about that i think there's a there's a couple of things it was revolutionary for me when I stumbled across Dr. Stephen Capp's work and I was in my master's um, and this is going to sound kind of silly and it's not, it's not that I'd never thought about it because I was doing my master's and but it was a moment where I was like 
oh my god another autistic person made it here and actually got further just seeing other autistic people grow up is enormous i mean it's one of the i'm not gonna lie because a lot of people sometimes say you shouldn't live for like external things and i'm like oh shit whatever gets you through the day that's fine so you don't need to be motivated by yourself on the time and that's really hard when you're you know you've got a lot of trauma you might have ptsd depression anxiety i won't lie some days the only reason that i get out of bed is because i have an autistic nephew who looks up to me and i want to let him know that there is a better future and that's it and i think i didn't i didn't have that when i was his age i was in such a dark place and i didn't see anyone else like me not on tv not in books not in the real world nowhere right i was so isolated i just couldn't picture it i think one of the most basic things is actually showing autistic children that there are autistic teenagers showing autistic teenagers that there are autistic adults and showing autistic adults that there are autistic elders because that is the only way to get the message across that at least some people make it um and that can be i mean there's hopefully a booming of literature coming out by autistic people with autistic characters that would have made a difference to me at least i know um and just filling up stories and narratives with something something good and positive like there was an absence of that for a whole generation of us and i think what you said and i think in particularly because of how open and the fantastic way that david describes your you know your journey and the things that you've struggled with and things i and so what you said monique about how and i agree and this is what i say a lot which is we can't go from this wholly deficit model and it's all doom and gloom because that's not the whole story but we can't go from that to completely holding everyone up as these superheroes because that would also be really detrimental it's the being realistic it's the saying to those younger people you can't you haven't seen me on the days where i lose my ability to speak you know and then david you obviously being so open about where you've been and where you are now yeah well i mean if if anyone wanted to call me a superhero i would say if anything i was an anti-hero oh <laughs> i was like oh, yeah, i agree <laughs> um <laughs> like uh um i know i know some people you know they they talk about how how you know wonderful my autistic mind is and i have to point out to them yeah but you know you've you've managed to avoid seeing me through the nearly a decade long of addiction psychosis you know all of the various things that came from being a traumatized autistic child in a world designed for neurotypical people um you know it it, it's it's not a thing we're going to change overnight you know i do think the onus is on society to make the change that's that's my opinion but i it it's it's a gradual process like with anything and uh you know i i think you know that's that's why it pleased me to see monique's presentation because i think we need more people thinking like that out there you know who are willing to stand up and say you know what stop blaming autistic people for their problems because yeah you know we're not perfect we're not perfect we are human we are just as human as anyone else but this is what society is doing to us and because we're human we are suffering because of it and i, I think because i mean the minority stress model it one of the things that it did actually was and i always try to remind people of the history so it actually came about as a thing around about the the depathologization of sexuality um and it's become a bigger thing 
but the way that it was used, especially actually during um, marriage equality or a move towards marriage equality in the United States, um, was it separated the outcomes for queer people and LGBT plus in general um, from them. And Elon Meyer's work on minority stress, the reason that it was so revolutionary um, was that it did separate queer people from the depression, the issues with addiction, the poor physical health outcomes, and said, well, if you live in a world that pathologizes sexuality, then yes, actually, gay people will become a pathology. But it's not because gay people or lesbians or bisexual or trans people are any different to the rest of the world. It's that straight people and cisgender people are so sure of their own supremacy that they will throw anything a bit different under the bus. Um, and that sums it up. I remember getting really stuck. I was doing a talk a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so this was the Met Police and fantastic group of people. And they were the one that I was, it's that group. And when I had to do some talks for 11 year olds, they were the two scariest things I've done in terms of doing some talks. But the majority of the personnel, personnel, sorry, were fantastic because they understand trauma. And I'm there explaining why we need to reduce stigma around mental health in, in, and think of it as trauma responses. They were great. There was this one person, there's always one. And eventually everyone around just started booing them and just saying, can we just hear the person who we actually, you know, came to, to listen to. But they said something really frustrating when I was trying to explain about how yes, the depathologization, the important depathologization of homosexuality, how that came out of the manual. And I made a kind of uh, com uh, a throwaway comment, if you like, that I've always made, which is that although it's still in there in some sneaky forms, right? Basically, if you don't like your sexuality or something along those lines, then you're still pathologized in those manuals. And this person was trying to argue with me that, well, yes, if those people are wanting to self-harm, if they're feeling suicidal, blah, 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 then it is, an, it is a pathology. And I couldn't, because I've never had anyone be so ignorant, come back at me with that. So being autistic, I didn't have a script prepared. And Jess, a uh, um, friend and, and colleague, afterwards said they had the perfect comeback. And they were like, that's basically like saying you have bullying disorder. Mm -hmm. Like when you're bullied, and you have a negative response to being bullied, it's a bullying disorder. And I was like, that's Jess, why were you not in my brain at that point in time? Because that's what we're talking about. And, and I did make a comment actually, which was um, a lot of what you talked about, and particularly with the broader social context stuff that you talked about, was that it supports what Annette Foster and I have said for several years, which lots of autistic people say now um, and discuss, um, which is that the diagnostic manuals really are based on more of a distressed autistic mm -hmm. experience than autistic per se. And this is this is the problem. So, and again, because lots of people look at me and they're like, but you've got like degrees and stuff. And actually, I'm not going to lie, whenever someone thinks that this was planned, I ended up with some of these by accident. So um, I did terribly in school. Um, and I mean, really bad because I was kind of, they, they labeled me like disruptive because I couldn't concentrate. So I'd sit in the back, trying to concentrate, trying to sit still, then start fidgeting, then talk to my friends, then make jokes, then laugh. And then they'd be like, could you not? And I'd be like, I'm trying, <laughs> it's just not working. And I would, try study but none of it would go in um there was so much pressure because everyone was like you're going nowhere and I was like no but I want to prove you wrong um and then I failed one of my leaving sad exams which is the equivalent of an A level um the other ones were like <laughs> as average as you can get um so like if you are to get all A's on the leaving cert um you could come out with between 600 and 700 leaving set points. 
I came out with a nice and smooth 300. Um, distinctly average. Um, and didn't get into any universities that I put down. So I went to um, something called Remote Business College to do a FETAC level five, which is like it, almost like community college version of a qualification. Um, managed to like do really well, but I was getting positive feedback for the first time in my education ever. Someone was like, good job, you're doing really well. And I was like, I'm going to live for this praise for the rest of my life because someone's saying something positive about me. Then I went to do my undergraduate because I got into a university based on my FETAC and I got the highest grade for psychology that the lecturer had ever given and I got more positive reinforcement so to speak where they were like that's great you're fantastic oh my god you're so clever you you just you must be a natural at this and I was like they're saying nice things about me I should keep this up so I didn't come below a 1-1 during my degree now to put this in perspective I was also in an abusive relationship that didn't keep me from my first class honours I was getting more physically sick that did not keep me from my first class honours because I was like this is the kind of praise that I live for now um did really fantastically so then people were like oh you're gonna are you gonna do a master's I was like I was great at that psychology thing so why don't I just do a master's into that and I was so burnt out from the work that I'd been doing because like I was doing my undergraduate, I was working part time, I was on the athletics team, um, I was volunteering, I was becoming like the perfect person because I was like if I'm perfect people can't reject me, right? If I'm absolutely perfect all the time then people can't reject me. Then I got into the masters um, and again it was the same so for example I was described as a rising star by someone and I was like oh my god I can make this my identity because then at least it's like safe because this is the kind of thing that autistic people end up craving because we get so little niceness like basic human decency growing up that the first time that we find something that is positive we like cling to it and we're like if I make this whole thing my identity then I can escape rejection um so then I was like, and I started reading the literature around autism and I came across this book and it was the worst thing I've ever read. I sobbed for like two weeks because its whole argument was that autistic people couldn't flourish, that autistic community did not exist um, because autistic people lack a theory of mind which makes autistic community connectedness impossible and on this basis, it's completely okay if below the age of 18 we use eugenic methods of removal on autistic people because they don't have an identity yet. I sobbed for like two weeks after reading this book and the whole reason that I did my PhD was that it was a giant fuck you to the author. I was like... And that's, that's it. I just really wanted to put the middle finger up at some philosopher in the US <laughs> who wrote something so derogatory. And I was like, well, okay, I'm going to go test this <laughs> in as many ways as I can. So I'll do a qualitative study. I'll build a model. I'll then go out and I'll test the validity of a measure to measure autistic community connectedness. And I'll look what it does to autistic people cross-sectionally and over time and you know what when I do eventually get it printed because the pandemic hit I swear to god I'm going to put it in a box mail it to them and be like you know what you were wrong in four different ways and also you should feel kind of bad because what you write is soul crushing and that's the only reason that I ended up doing a PhD 
Um, I really, really hope that you do get to send it to that person. And I would really like to know if they respond. <laughs> Genuinely, I will. Somebody <laughs> in the comment section says they bet the author still thinks the same thing now. Mm -hmm. And I think because when obviously we met the first time, as it were, the other day during the fantastic conference that Kieran Rose and the uh, Northeast Autism Society, I think they were, yeah. um, held about, you know, autistic acceptance. And there was just some great talks um, on, you know, that topic. And I think what was interesting is I think there was a comment about potentially some autistic people who may be at this point in time have rejected our community, the culture and so on, or just don't want to be part of it or haven't even found it yet. Um, and, and then obviously you might see those sorts of arguments on Twitter and places like that, where it says, well, my autistic child has a learning disability. They, they don't communicate in any way. Well, arguably they've not given them a way to communicate, but um, you know, so they can't become part of the culture, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yes, they can, they still, and if we do move away from that pathology and embrace the autistic culture, and we're still young, we're still, you know, building our community and there's still problems and, and things like that to be worked out, like any culture, I guess, um, that will be surrounding those individuals and, and humanizing those individuals that can't be a bad thing um we, we keep some autistic people locked away right and yes we've moved away from deinstitutionalization to a degree and i'm not going to say we've moved away completely because we we haven't that's that's just a lie that people tell themselves to make themselves feel better about all of the autistic people still in atus for example indefinitely um but instead of institutionalizing people in big buildings we now institutionalize them in little buildings and in homes right so people point to autistic people who might have learning disabilities or communicate differently and they're like yeah but what about these people and you're like have you considered that you should also help those people to access other people and there's this moment that crosses people's faces and I've worked in social care practice. I can tell you now that the thought terrifies social care workers, social workers. They're like, but no, they can't go into the community because they've got challenging behavior. And you're like, A, no, that is not a thing. And B, do you think maybe people might have a better quality of life if they did actually have access to things like friendship. But instead, a lot of these community homes are set up in a way that just doesn't foster any form of connectivity. So for example, I've, I've even worked in nursing homes, for example, that instead of setting up tables and chairs in a way that mean that people can make conversation, they line them up against the wall so that you're sitting there's like 10 feet between you and the person over there and someone else is like sitting there. It's basic things like that where in group homes for all kinds of people, we tend to make it as easy as possible for the staff, regardless of whether or not that facilitates well-being for the people who are living there, even though it's their home. And we do this for autistic people with learning disabilities all the time and then I'm say so, well they can't do it i'm so glad to hear you bring up the uh the, the the group living situation because something i've been trying to work out in my head for ages to write because i want to write about it is i've i've been on psychiatric wards twice in my life and you get the distinct impression when you're there that the staff see you as a nuisance that exists in their workplace rather than them being people coming into the place that you are living in, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, it's 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 soul crushing, especially in a place like a psychiatric ward, where pretty much all of us were really quite profoundly ill at the time, and we're treated as a nuisance in the workplace. 
and it, it's so interesting that you say that because one of the biggest predictors of suicide is what's called thwarted belonging and burdensomeness and it's the idea where when you feel detached from the people around you and when you feel like a burden that is actually when you're most likely to be vulnerable to taking your own life um and yet we set up community homes that are nothing but thwarted belongingness and we treat people like burdens in them and it's I mean one of the reasons that I left the social care practice was I couldn't abide by a system that just systematically treats people's homes like other people's workplaces and that's it um but yeah you see it come up a lot and the other really interesting thing is the same people who are saying yeah but what about autistic people with learning disabilities or autistic people who use assisted communication you just know they're the type of people who won't listen to any autistic people right because they they discount one autistic person and say but what about this one and then that autistic person will find a way to communicate and they'll be like no but you can communicate therefore you're not autistic and they'll just keep finding someone else to be like well you're marginalizing that person over there and they'll just find a way to ignore basically everyone and i think what you said as well which is and that because for instance if you were to say well those individuals we need to create a means or a way for them to create friendship and things like that. And the problem you will have is the non-autistic person has such a very narrow understanding of what friendship means. Friendship does not have to mean reciprocal communication. It doesn't, it could literally just mean being in the same space and doing a repetitive behavior next to another person you know it's this it's this very narrow idea about what that could mean and we are very very aware that autistic friendship is not that narrow even when we can communicate it's not that narrow idea of friendship so there's this really interesting article that um hopefully at some point i always say i'm definitely gonna write this um <laughs> but there's i write in a different chapter about cultural imperialism. And it was actually Damien Milton. Um, he's an editor of a, a collection that I might have a chapter in. And in it, I was talking about like the denial of subjectivity of autistic people. And what that basically means is that we pretend that autistic people don't or are not allowed to have feelings that are valid on things, right? So an autistic person will be like, <laughs> I really wish you wouldn't research cures, for example. And the researcher will be like, yeah, but what about that other autistic person? Or they'll be like, yeah, but I don't care, right? And we, we just disregard autistic people's feelings on a lot of things, including language um, and, you know, identity first language, for example. Um, and in one of his articles, Damien Milton talks about cultural imperialism. Um, and one of the things that I want to talk about is a cultural imperialism in the concept of community and friendship. And it's basically that non-autistic people have defined community. They have defined friendship. They look at friendship and community that autistic people experience and they will find any way that they can to discount it. They will be like, oh, but you only see each other once every three months that's not friendship oh when you see each other you talk like kind of infrequently that's not friendship oh it's all online that's not friendship oh you know you just kind of like info dump with each other that's not reciprocal enough and it is a cultural imperialism that just basically like steamrolls over whatever autistic people find meaningful and tries to point out all the ways in which it's somehow broken or evidence of a pathology my closest friends sometimes we will just sit in silence 
It is lovely. It is refreshing for me. Other people look at that and they're like, oh, you mustn't be very close. And I'm like, these people are like my siblings. Silence is sometimes a language of love, right? But it doesn't look like it from the outside. So you don't value it, but I do. And I think, and that's, that's quite interesting as well, because for the first time in months, I have had two new human beings in my space today um, uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, both autistic, obviously. And at one point, one got a bit overwhelmed, got a bit tired and things, just had a little nap on one of my spare sofas. You know, you don't do that kind of thing. That's, that's an, in a neurotypical environment, you go around your friend's house, you can't have a nap. You know, the other one was like, is it OK if I bring my switch and I just play on my switch for quite a bit of time? Of course it is. If that's what you want to do. It wasn't that we had this. We weren't going to sit and just have these big, long conversations for ages. It was a uh, OK, you're going to do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. The other person was having a little snooze. You know, those are not seen as acceptable friendship things that you do. Um, which I think is quite a sad state of affairs. And I see this as well in, for example, um, in kind of neurodivergent, neurodivergent relationships. So, for example, someone came to our research group once because they wanted some advice on a character that they were writing for a book um, and they didn't belong to the community that the character was about and my first thing was why why are you writing about this group and they were like oh well you know there's a story to be told and I was like is it your story and they were like oh yeah but I've spoken to experts and I was like have you spoken to the group no and one of the things that they were talking about um they were like oh I'm worried that this this character is going to come off as autistic you know, they don't like to be touched. Um, they don't like physical contact. So, and I was like, okay. And then, and then there was a pause and then she was like, yeah, but can you imagine how impossible love is when you don't like to be touched? And I, I was just staring at my laptop and I paused for a second and I was like, what sort of neuronormative crap is that? And I mean, I had the full support of my mentor, thank God, because my mentor is really good. Like, she was equally offended. Um, and I was like, so first of all, don't write about a group that you don't belong to. Like, especially not a fiction story. Like, it's so needless so needless but also you do not need touch to form love you do not need a specific type of intimacy to have a relationship and you do not need someone to just like be draped on you for that to come across and yet she had this whole conceptualization that if there wasn't things like touching and if someone didn't like being hugged, that they would never form love. And I was it's like, like, that's me. I hate being touched. I'm in a five year relationship. <laughs> well, all, all, of, all of these things, they, they come from fundamentally a denial of the validity of autistic and neurodivergent culture, don't they? Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that uh, I, I won't touch on this too much because we're going to get into it in a live stream later this month. But one of the things that I think could really improve this is if people from outside of autistic, the autistic world came and experienced our culture alongside us the same way you go on holiday and experience another culture preferably without appropriating it although as i've said before i 
I, I, it's, I think it's a difficult culture to appropriate. Um, but, you know, it's, um, I, I think we need neurotypical people to actually stop and think, do you know what? Perhaps this culture does exist and perhaps I need to explore it a bit and come to understand it rather than just fundamentally deny its validity and tell all these autistic people that they don't know what they're talking about. Because it's just yet another way that we're beaten down by a neuronormative society. Exactly. And I think as well, so for example, I think there are a lot of people and some of them neurotypical, some of them I don't think so neurotypical across like our families that have seen the relationship that I've developed with my my spouse. Um, and it doesn't look how I think they thought a relationship necessarily should. Um, and yet, everyone's like, wow, I get it now, right? Because before, I think people would kind of, I don't know, I think people would look at us a little bit funny and be like, what, what do you mean you just sit together? And I'd be like, I don't know how to explain this like any more than I have. Um, but then they would see the joy and the laughter and the happiness. And I think when people come to our home, they see a lot of happiness, right? They see just this really neurodivergent way of having a relationship, a neurodivergent culture in our house. And it is like a neurodivergent culture. Um, and suddenly they get this overwhelming sense where they're like, that's what it means for a relationship to flourish. And it doesn't look like a different relationship. It doesn't look like a, like two non-autistic people or two like neurotypical people. It doesn't look like that because that's not what makes us happy. And it's not what makes it work. And the thing is, like we're brutally honest with each other and we've got this like really clear communication that I think terrifies some people because they look at it and they're like no I think you're meant to say it and I'm like but that would be lying so I'm not gonna say that and people misunderstand that radical honesty sometimes that we might have with each other and they're like but isn't that a bit mean and I'm like no lying is mean <laughs> um but maybe if people did come in and see more and came into autistic, and I mean, when I say autistic spaces, because I always clarify this, and it was really good hearing Chloe clarify this the other day. I mean, like proper autistic spaces. I don't mean where a neurotypical has made a space for an autistic person and there's like one autistic person. I mean, autistic, autistic spaces. I think if people were to come in and see the communication and the love and the respect and the happiness that autistic people have for other autistic people, they might stop thinking that we're somehow socially and communicationally deficit. And they might be like, oh, those are actually some like really nice bonds. But for that to happen, they would first have to appreciate A, that it is a culture and B, that we're fundamentally human. I think some people struggle with because some people are a little bit bad and I think part of that as well is that the idea of the sort of traditional if you like relationship it doesn't work for most people because there's so much pressure placed on your partner to be all singing all dancing that they're supposed to be your best friend your lover, when you're poorly, they're supposed to look after you, you know, all those kinds of, and I think that's far too much pressure to put on another human being, just one single human being. <laughs> and I think with, in our little autistic, our personal little autistic space that we have for ourselves. So I don't have a very big, there's not a big anything around me. There's, I've got like three friends and my partner and the cat, you know, but the point being that I don't place everything expectation on my partner. He's autistic as well with attention differences. 
his attention span sometimes means I could want to tell him about something, but he's got about 20 seconds attention span and that's it. He's done and he gets jig jiggity and he has to sort of go off and do something else. So it's about realizing your expectations and what's possible that I will then need to have a friend that I have those conversations with because actually I can't expect my partner to do that and this kind of thing so I feel that potentially once we get to a place where we understand our own needs which is really difficult as autistic people and to recognize our own boundaries what we are prepared to accept in a relationship and what we're not prepared to accept because that's different for everybody then those relationships can become quite good I think it comes from once again you know neurotypical society loves these whole one size fits all approaches to everything um you know so in relationships you know every partner has to fulfill the same roles as everyone else's partner you know and i've noticed this you know the, the expectations of neurotypical society it doesn't matter what the topic is that it just always seems to be a one size fits all thing it just assumes that everyone thinks and acts the same way and and it's just you know it, it is and i've got to say and this is going back a bit i do love that you've used the word neuronormative because i've used that in my writing and i was never quite sure if i was using it right but after watching that presentation i now know i've been using it right <laughs> it's the it's the same way so toxic masculinity it doesn't even work for men <laughs> you're like it's it's that we have these systems um these normative systems that yes, they might work more for a certain group, but they don't work. Um, and that's the problem with like neuronormativity and the normative expectations of relationships is they're not working for neurotypical people either. Um, like you say, and it's the same way. Like, yes, homophobia really doesn't work for the, the gay community, for example. Biphobia really doesn't work for the bi community, but also it doesn't work for straight people either because it it's telling you something's going horribly wrong in society um and there are all of these systems that have been set up by like dominant cultures dominant forces um so on but they're failing a lot of people and that's why i think that i've got hope for a better future because i think people are realizing just how much these things are failing and I don't know because when you were saying you know that maybe autistic people don't have the same expectations for one person to be like everything and part of me thinks because anecdotally um I've noticed that autistic people are also more likely to be um polyamorous and that's not everyone um obviously but it makes me wonder if there's something to that where autistic people have relationships and they don't expect that person to be everything because also we know what it's like for someone to expect everything from us all of the time and what it feels like when people tell you well you haven't lived up to something um and it yeah something that i notice around me is that actually like and i think it also makes for like more low maintenance friendships because if you haven't heard from an autistic friend in like two months you don't assume that something's like desperately wrong you're not like um and yeah you can just drop in and be like like i mean by message don't drop in on a person's home on a night i know you said that and my heart went no <laughs> i'm like no 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 <laughs> um but if you send a message right I don't think there's the same pressure to be like, well, why haven't you texted me for like every day, every week? There's just like, hey, hey, how you keeping? And I even have things like I've done, I think I must have done this with you, David, as well, which is I'll see a message and I don't have the cognitive resources to reply, but I don't, you know, I want to at some point. So I might just say to the person, leaving this on unread, but I'll come back to it so that they know that I, I've seen it. I just can't do anything with it right then. And I've, you know, I think I've never had any of my autistic 
friends or people that you know I've connected with who find that a problem I think they get it they're like oh you know at least I had a spoon to be able to say you know I'm leaving you on unread but I'm coming back <laughs> this is the thing though isn't it I think when we accommodate marginalized communities it benefits everyone you know if we made accommodations for autistic people like in society as a whole society would become a lot more comfortable for everybody <laughs> exactly and it's one of those things where it's like it turns out that when you make a system that's flexible it's more comfortable for a lot of people and that's usually something that's really radical in people's head they're like what do you mean flexibility and i'm like could give it a go make a system that doesn't marginalize people see how that works for you um and it turns out that these things just work better um yeah i've noticed that we've been going for an extra 45 minutes hello lovely 34 people who are still here have you got autistic inertia and you just can't do something else until we finished um i've got maybe one or two little comments left so I don't know David if you had any extra things that you noted or wanted to ask about no no I I, I think we've we've covered a lot of what I wanted to ask about Covered a lot of ground it's great um <laughs> before we get to the sort of nicer end I like to end on a nice um uh, note as it were because obviously these are quite uh, um in depth and sometimes obviously with the trigger warnings and things um, sort of sensitive topics. We did have one from a learner, which is a bit of a difficult one to try to answer because of safeguarding. But their question very, very early on was what are the less recognized ways of self harm, for example, please. So obviously answering this without going into detail, if we can, um, I think it's fair to say that your earlier discussion, particularly between you and David about addiction and substance misuse and things like that um, could be classed as a, well, it's not necessarily a less recognized, but it, it certainly could be classed as self-harm. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be really careful because I also don't want to trigger anyone. Yeah. That's obviously not my intention, but actually, um, a study found that autistic people were more likely to use fatal methods, um, so self-harm that didn't intend to be related to suicide but results in it, um, but also things like ligatures, and I don't want to go more into that really, but it's self-harm that involves like, for example, cutting off blood flow. Um, and part of it might be to regulate sensory needs and then it just escalates. Um, that's an example of one that autistic people are more likely um, to use. Yeah, it's a very difficult topic, um, like I say, so it's, it's difficult because it's something we really can't go into detail. So sorry if that didn't really answer that particular learner's question. Um, so like I say, it's, it's, it's difficult, we can't really go into detail. Um, if anyone's got like really specific questions, I don't mind answering people's email. Um, you can find my email, like I think it was attached to this actually, or I've Twitter. got a website. Um, and I'm more than happy to have like individual conversations with people because then there are less safeguarding issues. Um, and I, but I'm still not going to go into like graphic yeah. detail because that's that's excessive and no one needs it yeah okay and and like i say i wanted to get that one out before because it's quite a sensitive topic um and i think my last thing because i think i've crossed through the comments that you we've already talked about which is great my last thing which is kind of we've already mentioned it but i think hammering home that point of so my note was i wholly agree with the issue of using some of us in the community as goalposts i think that's really problematic because that shouldn't happen because all autistic people are worthy of life and happiness on their terms. And, you know, so it, it, okay, if you, so when people will say something like, 
you're such an inspiration, Monique. And it's kind of like, that can be, or come across as quite an empty gesture. Okay, what has Monique inspired you to do? What are you going to do with that inspiration? Otherwise it sounds kind of an empty gesture um, to just say that. And, and we also will find that awkward because we're kind of like compliments, that's weird um, kind of thing. Um, so I think, yeah, I, um, being more realistic and balanced, you know, we are still autistic at the end of the day. Um, and it's not like my, I'm not going to go into it, but my um, sort of education sounds relatively similar to yours, Monique, in the term, you know, terms of uh, didn't do well at school and needed that person to actually be able to recognize your abilities and things mine like that. as well mine as well yes and at some point um david maybe we can support you to do some research into the issue which is that there's not enough research on addiction and autistic people um not that i'm trying to like shoehorn you into education that might not be what you necessarily <laughs> want um but i think that's really important it's it's the goal shouldn't be for anybody to to who's autistic to get a certain education or get this or get that it's purely should be for them to be happy in their own bodies their own skin their own environment exactly and i i stress this to people all the time what one autistic person looks like thriving that's that's one person you can't you can't hold them up and be like this is what like thriving looks like when you're autistic because it's so different people have different goals people have different wants different needs like i i don't want to be anyone's ideal because it also strips me of my own humanity and i i think a lot of autistic people feel like this because it's so funny people say you know you're a person with autism because i don't want to reduce you to your autism or whatever we're like no we're autistic but thanks and then they somehow still manage to strip away your humanity by saying that you have to be this one thing that this is what a successful autistic looks like and i pointed out to a lot of people yeah i have a career at the moment precarious it's academia academia i live contract to contract it's soul destroying um but also i wouldn't classify myself as successful yet because i have a boatload of trauma i have a really severe depression and i'm not even if i've got a happy home and i'm a happy ish person i'm not content so people hold me up and they're like but you've got a phd and i'm like yeah, but actually, if I could go back and do this all differently, I just want to find a form of being where my, my sense of self isn't tied up in achieving things. And actually, if the world were a little bit more equal, I would have been happy and content to, for example, have a little house on a plot of land with some chickens and some goats. And that's my idea of happiness. But I'm too terrified to go out and do that because then people will look at me and be like, but you had so much potential because we look at autistic people and we only recognize like traditional things like this as thriving. This isn't thriving. This is this is living. It's a lot of masking. I mask all the time. I'm excellent did it but this isn't to me this isn't success yet it just looks like it because people are using a traditional measuring bar and they're like but you made it to the top right and i'm like but i didn't i didn't necessarily want to be here um and i think that's the thing as well is the oh no train of thought help <laughs> no it's gone <laughs> Oh, yes, it's back again, thank God. Right, um, which is this issue of people talking about your potential. And um, they don't mean your individual, individualized potential, which is really down to you. What they mean is 
this expectation or standard so they misuse the word potential far too often i say they <laughs> the big they but you know um people <laughs> will will say you know but we want them to reach their potential no what you want is for them to reach certain goals that you feel are important for that person and i have seen or heard you know of well-meaning schools for instance will do that thing of going let's talk about autism look at these fantastic autistic people who've done all these amazing things no that's inspiration porn and it's horrible and and now what you've basically told the non-autistics and the autistics in that classroom is that to be worthy of anything, totally you have true. to achieve these ridiculous things. Like they might even talk about Einstein and try and connect, you know. And like Newton and then they're like Tesla. And you're like, just leave these dead people be. <laughs> <laughs> like just, just leave them in their graves and see me as a person and I don't need to do all of those things to have like fundamental humanity and this is where people misunderstand neurodiversity right neurodiversity is not look at these geniuses it's that no matter what no matter what a person achieves no matter what they do in the morning noon or night they are fundamentally human and that is unshakable and they deserve an equal respect regardless which is why it doesn't leave anyone out it's the most inclusive paradigm because it's based on the fact that you are just fundamentally irregardless of anything human that's it i've caught autistic people doing it to themselves sometimes though because you know like there's this really fine line to be walked between like let's take pride in like okay yeah there's some really cool stuff like the inventor of pokemon was autistic and you know, maybe Einstein was autistic. I, I'm, I'm not convinced there was ever actually any conclusive proof on that. Um, but, you know, um, you, you know, it, yeah, okay, take pride in it. We've done some cool stuff as autistic people, but sometimes it is, the way it's held up, it's it's inspiration porny, and uh, it's, that, that's actually a little icky. <laughs> and that's why I always say, you know, equality, some of us are average. Some of us are bog standard. And you know what? That's okay. Because plenty of non-autistic people are average or bog standard. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't need to be all singing or dancing to be worthy of life. Um, so, yeah, because that's just a problem. Maybe okay. Autism Acceptance Month needs a graphic that just has pictures of average autistic people. Like, here's Joe. He works in Asda uh here's here's uh simone uh they work in uh costa coffee <laughs> well, that's the thing and i because i don't think that i'll be in academia forever i think that i'll do it until the grace runs out um and then i'm more than happy to go sit on a farm somewhere and have my chickens and be bog standard not known and the thing is I never meant, and I don't think people understand this, I never meant to be here. If people weren't so shit, I wouldn't. Like, I've got a message, and I'll do what I can to get that out, but A, I never meant to be, like, a role model. I never meant to be an advocate, even. I never meant to do any of this. This came about because someone said something really shit, and I was like, you're so many levels of wrong and the pedant in me needs to prove it in every way that i can um and that's how i ended up here and i'll do it and but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna die to it i'm not gonna like chip away at myself until there's nothing left um we shouldn't need to be advocating because we shouldn't be in this situation um and then eventually i'm gonna go have my chickens and they're going to be the do best. You, do you want a little plot within the Autopia that commune that we're planning? Yes. Okay. <laughs> as long as I've got room for my books. Then and I'm your happy. chickens. And yeah. Exactly. And like a goat. Yeah. And Jessica's going to be in charge of the equine therapy center. Louis wants to do some planting. You know, we, yeah, the plan is everyone's going to find their little niche, whatever that might be. Have herbs and herb garden do some cooking and read some books and 
be friends with the chickens. I've got dibs on the historian role. There you oh, go. Fantastic. You go. <laughs> Autistic history, right? Historian. That would be amazing. Um, okay, this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, so my final lovely comment, um, I've also pinned one from Sai just because it amused me, which was the, what do I, if I say beep, beep, I'm a sheep. <laughs> Sorry, I said beep beep. I'm a sheep. Oh my god, I, I still haven't stopped with that. Um, literally, we still bounce around the house. Um, and we're like beep beep. I'm a sheep. I say beep beep. I'm a sheep. Um, I'm just never gonna stop with that. I came away. So, so for people who have no idea why we just suddenly did did that. Um, so when I saw Monique talk the other day during the the conference that we um uh, both attended. Um, Monique made the comment about doing the beep beep I'm a sheep around your partner right um, and then we had a talk afterwards because we'd already booked to have a chat about about Monique coming on Academy and how it was going to work and all that kind of business um, and then I brought it up again because it had been a thing that I'd been doing for a while like a few months back and you reminded me and then I came out and I went up to Louis and I was like beep and I was doing this to him he's like oh no not again I thought this one had gone because he's used to me having some song or something that I will do over and over and over again for weeks sometimes months and he was just like I thought that one had gone <laughs> so I started doing it again it was fantastic oh I'm just sorry I've just seen that uh Wendy says intrigued by your top oh it's it's just a Doctor Who hoodie which amuses me because I want everybody to imagine that obviously the inside of the hoodie is bigger than it is on the outside. So that if you imagine like I'm inside with just my feet dangling like this, <laughs> that's what I want people to imagine. Um, so that was my comment that I, um, I pinned from um, Cy because he put beep beep to remind me because um, it amused him as well. And so our final comment for all our guests is what is your favorite stim? Oh. So <laughs> Chloe warned me about this and it's like lucky that she did because otherwise I would have panicked and I would have been like um but actually um and this one gets discounted a lot and it makes me really annoyed because um people think of stims only as being like motor sensory and I'm like oh no 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 um and it's this idea that autism has to be external my go-to stim and it has been since I was like 13 or 14 is music and I will play the same song again 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 my record um for this was listening to the same song I think it was like 61 times in a day and I will just do it and it will be that there is a melody in it that I just fall in love with and it it feels really good in my brain which sounds weird if you don't get it um but it will just it'll give me a sensation and I will be like I'm going to use that sensation to regulate myself for the rest of the day um and I'll just keep listening to it um and the song itself would change um so actually the the latest one for me um is a song um that no one's ever really heard of called um Pin Up Daddy by, um, oh, her name's gone from my head, um, pardon? Oh, Rep Madison, um, thank you, and <laughs> I will just listen to it again and again and again and again and again and again, and that's my favourite one because, like, it brings me so much, so much joy, it really, it, God, God bless the patience of my mother because even before we knew that I was autistic we would be driving and she'd be like is this the seventh time we've listened to this Snow Patrol song and I'll be like it's actually the ninth but yes and then she'd be like huh okay then <laughs> we would just keep going um so that's the stim that I like to regulate myself with most that followed by looking at books not necessarily reading them which again sounds weird because i do love reading books 
um, but literally just feeling book covers um, and playing with the pages. I do like to, so periodically when I'm reading at night, I will just stop and flick the pages to smell them. And because they all smell different, don't they? Like some smell <laughs> older or mustier or something like that. So I'll be reading, I'll just get this impulse to be like, I need to know what you smell like book. <laughs> and just flick the pages to have a sniff. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's joyous. It is absolutely joyous. Um, yeah. What about you, David? I've, I've, you've probably told us on Academy before. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm a cornucopia of all sorts of different stims, to be honest. Um, but I do really enjoy actually listening to the same songs over and over and over. And actually, the one that I'm really hooked on at the moment is Over Those Hills by Hayley Williams. So that's the lead singer of Paramore. She's done two solo albums in the past 12 months. And I mean, in general, I can't stop listening to both of those albums. But on the second album, there is Over Those Hills. And uh, I, I just cannot stop listening to it. I am I hate the word obsessed, but I am obsessed with that song. I was going to say, it's, I, I th it's such an underrated stim people don't recognize it as that and i think it's one of those that's actually more like normalized in our society so people are like, oh no no like, everyone does that and you're like not to the same degree though yeah the the thing is is even some of my autistic friends get sick of hearing me play the same songs over and over they're like david like we know this song off by heart now can we please have a different different artist different song whatever <laughs> just please and i'm <laughs> I'm like, no, I, you don't understand. I can't stop listening to this. Oh, my God. I went through a stage, and I, I never understood this. So, like, every now and again, someone would be like, oh, this is my guilty pleasure. And I wouldn't understand the idea of a guilty pleasure because I'd be like, why are you so ashamed of yourself to like this? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you can't really listen to that band. So you see people say, like, oh, Taylor Swift's my guilty pleasure. And I'm like, oh, you could just enjoy the music of Taylor Swift. Swift. Yeah. Um, but for for ages, my go to was um the National because I like listening with my headphones in, and the National as a band create music that I swear to God is meant to be listened to with headphones because it improves it like so much, and they've got these like melodies in all of their songs, um, and the melodies themselves are like so complicated and yet soothing, um, and I went through a stage where I was just listening to like. I think it must have been like five different um the national songs again and again and again so much so that at one point we were sitting having lunch and i turned to sam and i just kind of started singing but the lyric that came out was i was afraid that i'd eat your brain and he just <laughs> kind of looked up at me and he's like pardon and i was like oh it's a song from conversation 16 by the national he was like are you sure that's a lyric in the song and i was like no no no, i'm positive he was like i think i would have noticed that is a song like and then i played it for him and he was like i've never noticed that um and now really awkwardly every now and again the same lyric goes through my brain i was afraid i'd eat your brain um and every now and again i accidentally say it out loud and everyone's like and i'm like <laughs> But it's, it's not I mean at least because I've said this I've said this before and I was saying this to Louis again the other day after I'd had that conversation with you Monique about how I make up these little songs and some of them I've been singing to Louis all day every day for the last five or so years you know um and I just do this thing where I go I'm so great at singing and I just sing at him all the time I can never remember what they are any time I try to explain to somebody else I don't know what they are they just happen when I'm around Louis and I can never remember what half of them actually are. And I think all of that is kind of tied in with, so your thing of going around doing Beep Beep I'm a Sheep and the listening to the music. And uh, do you also do echolasia, so where it's in your head as well. And you're like repeating the lovely l sounds and what have you over and over in your head. Um, and Sai's just made a comment as well, which is, I'm stuck on this as well because of Sai and whoever introduced Sai to it, which is Arctic Radio. So what's the actual station? 
I can't, garden, radio garden or something like that, isn't it? Radio garden, yeah. I think it's radio garden. It's a fantastic app. You can basically listen to any radio station from the globe. But we've been listening to an Arctic outpost, a specific outpost in the Arctic that just plays 1940s music 24 seven without <laughs> adverts right that's fantastic and i love i like sort of 1940s style music and yeah. i did go for a phase of listening to it all the time and now i've come back to it so if anyone's not seen that um app it's actually really really good i'm i'm going to need details because <laughs> learning that there is a, a a station out there that plays nothing but 1940s music 24 hours a day without breaks this is this is like a huge moment for me. It's beautiful. And just I'm really, case... I'm really working to contain myself right oh, now. Okay. What I want to do is go, oh my God. Oh, it's <laughs> Radio Garden, someone's just said. Are you finding the link? He's going to try and find the link. Um, it is amazing. And because what I like about it, there's no adverts. Occasionally, it will just say that you're listening to Arctic Radio and what the, the wave, uh, the band wave? Why is that not a thing? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, it just does that occasionally, but the majority of it is just back-to-back -back music um, and it's lovely. And this is the thing with music as well, is I always have to have background noise because little noises really bug me, like I'm sure with lots of people. I put it, I'm sure like everybody else, on the most low level I could possibly get on my phone. I will like bring up the thing until it's like right on the cusp of being mute on my phone because it just has to be that very, very low level. Um, and the last one I was gonna say is, um, yeah, some recent things I found was this band called Mother Mother, if anyone's heard of Mother Mother, and a particular one called Hayloft. And there's some really um, interesting, what I would class as twangly <laughs> moments in it. And I like the twangliness. Um, so feel free to have a, anybody have a listen to Mother Mother Hayloft. It's basically about a couple who get caught in the hayloft by the dad kind of thing. Um, but it's there's something very, yeah, twangly that I like about the music. Um, and so for both of you, if you are interested in the uh, Arctic Radio in particular, but you can find any of the um, stations, uh, Cy has just popped it in the comment section as well. Excellent. Lovely. So that's, we've gone 10 o'clock. This has been a really good, we've just I'm got so stuck sorry. in. Um, <laughs> so thank you everybody so much. That 32 people, how many of you definitely have inertia and just can't move away from whatever <laughs> position you're in? Um, so thank you so much. We've had Monique, I've been Chloe, and we've also had David. And next week, um, David and I will be very excitedly talking to Krista Homans. And so that's about making the workplace more neurodivergent friendly, which is what Krista um, focuses on quite a lot when they do training with people. So Krista Homans, um, also known as Neurodivergent Rebel, which is gonna be a fantastic one next week as well. Lovely, so thank you everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye.